saw me stumbling around up here after I got up. As I sat on it about halfway, and my left leg went to sleep. When I went to stand up, I almost went down that way. So I told Jonathan, I won't stand up tonight. If I fall, it's up to him to get up here and catch me. <laughs> so if it's not one thing, it's something else. In our study of Second Peter, one of the things that we <clears throat> noticed in the back adult class is that he said in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. And then the emphasis is here, Yea, I think it meet, suitable, as long as I am in this tabernacle, my physical body, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly, verse 14, I must put off this, my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. It's obvious that Peter, being the Christian he was, and certainly in the special position as an apostle of Jesus Christ, was deeply concerned about the churches. We see that same attitude displayed by the apostle Paul when he tells about all the things that came upon him because of his service to Christ, then he says, and besides that which cometh on me daily, the care of all the churches. I often say to those who are elders, you have just the care of one congregation. Paul, as an ambassador of the court of heaven, as true of the other apostles, had the care while they were on this earth doing their work of all the churches. They, in effect, uh, were almost in the position of a New Testament. Because at one time, the Holy Spirit was in men to guide them in the way of Christ. Then it was transferred in writing to a book. And so now we have the apostles' doctrine in the New Testament of Jesus Christ. But it has always been the case that such worthies were concerned about those left behind. And I see that also in the Old Testament. In Psalm 71, verses 17 and 18. Psalm 71, 17, and 18. Now, now think about this, those of us who are older in particular. And if you live here, you're going to continue to get older. There's only one way you are on this earth and you don't get older. <laughs> and that means you've left your body behind. But this passage reads, O God, Thou hast taught me from my youth, and hitherto have I declared Thy wondrous work. Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, forsake me not until I have showed thy strength unto this generation. The emphasis is on the last part of it. Until I have showed thy strength unto this generation. It's rather obvious then that as long as a person being a servant of God is in this body and able to function then he wants to teach the truth. He wants to live the truth. He wants to defend the truth. And the truth becomes one's chief concern. But now a question. How long does it take to lose the truth? How long does it take to lose the truth? Can it be lost in one generation? Yes. If we fail to teach that truth, it can be lost. But more than this, and here's where I'm aiming at young people and parents. And I pause here to interject this. The last two weeks we've had sermons that dealt with young people starting off early in serving God, molding your life around the love of the truth and the living it. And today I want to mention more about that. How long would it take to lose the truth? If parents fail to teach their children and churches fail to teach members as well as to take the Great Commission seriously to teach the gospel to the lost, then the simple question is where shall we be in the next generation? Well, I'm old enough to know how that happens because I've witnessed it. I have seen what happens where people ceased to respect the inspired word of God as the final authority. 
and to where they would give anything to be obedient to the truth and to where more and more people just casually give a nod if they do that much toward the Bible as the Word of God. So it's possible to lose the truth completely in just one brief generation. Now the question I ask here, is this a sobering fact to us? If this is still a religious meeting house five years from now, what will those meeting here believe? What will they practice ten years from now? Now, when I get out to ten years from now at my age, I recognize that some of us may be in that city. Or at least, if the world hadn't ended, in Abraham's bosom. And then what for those that remain as far as their knowledge and practice of the truth, their love of the truth, and their conviction of the truth? It's understood we're to teach others so that the gospel may continue generation after generation. Paul said to Timothy, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. The psalmist, in the quotation we just gave from Psalm 71, 17 through 18, thought this responsibility was an important one. And evidently, it was a deep one to him. So he's asking in this passage for an opportunity to show God's strength unto the generation he was living in, though he was old and gray-headed at that time. And that hits a few of us even now. What are we going to do with our lives, young or old, if we don't live the truth and teach it and defend it? What's life all about? And a great many people haven't understood that yet. whole host of most people just don't understand the design and purpose of life in the flesh. But it's to find God and serve Him and get ready for eternity. Listen to what we have in the Old Testament. And as I read these Old Testament passages, remember Paul's writing in Romans 15, 4, is to the benefit of those Old Testament scriptures to us who serve Christ under the authority of Christ in the New Testament. This is recorded. And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all of the days of the elders that outlived Joshua and which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. Joshua 24, verse 31. Now, if you go ahead and read You'll see following that last generation mentioned here, and that wasn't too far away from the events when they actually happened that he mentions concerning the works of the Lord, they then went after the idolatrous crowds among whom they lived, even refusing, as they had agreed to, to drive out all the people that they should have driven out of the land of Canaan that God had given them as a land flowing with milk and honey. So we may well ask ourselves what congregations the Lord's church are teaching, but I think it's far better and gets right down to the core of the matter to ask ourselves what parents are teaching their children. Uh, people like to keep up with current events. They like to hear the news. Well, that's good. I like to know what's going on. But I find that members of the church, if they know much about what's going on in the very congregation of which they're members, it's an amazing thing. Question, how many of you read the bulletin regularly? How many of you pay attention to what's going on here? Well, much less the brotherhood in general. Now, there was a time when we lived so far apart and communications were such that what's happening over in Arkansas or Mississippi or Kentucky or New York, where it might be, California, might not impact us so fast. But I'm telling you, what's their trouble Today is ours tomorrow. Now, what does that imply about us in keeping up with current events? And now I speak specifically what's going on in the church. Not just to study the Bible and know God's will or what I'm supposed to do right here, but what may come in that back door. Or to use more in harmony the scriptures, they came in privily, which means they came in that side door. They're not going to come in. Nobody is. I don't care if there's five people who are faithful to God. Whoever comes is going to bring false doctrine. He's not going to come in and say, all right, the devil's here. I'm fixing to teach something. going to damn your soul, but I sure want you to believe it. It's not going to work that way. It never has worked that way. People come in sounding good, 
looking good, smelling good, and they sweep the heart of the people away because we put our trust too much in the outward appearance, not on the substance of things, of what people really believe and how they prove themselves. No wonder Paul said to Timothy, lay hand suddenly on no man. What did he mean? Well, the customs of the day meant you approve people you laid hands on. You don't do it in a hurry. You remember how hard uh, Paul had, hard a time he had joining himself to the other apostles in Jerusalem? Because all that had been proven about him is that he's going to kill as many Christians as he can, put the rest of them in prison. And they knew Barnabas, and Barnabas knew him, and after his conversion, here's somebody the apostles could trust. So they listened to Barnabas, and he said, no, he's converted. He's now preaching Christ. And so they accepted it. Well, was that the fault of the apostles to be so slow? No. They were just practicing what Paul told Timothy to do. And thus, when we're taught already to prove all things, hold fast that which is good, well, all things means people and what they teach, not just how they look, how they smell. <laughs> so, we need to understand how quickly a church can depart from the truth, which means how quickly any one of us can depart from the truth. And then let me add this to it. If you pull about four or five people out of the congregation right now, our teaching staff falls flat. Where are they coming from, folks? Where are the people that know the Bible and live the Bible and set the proper example and have the ability to teach it? Where are they going to come from? Well, you can't tell you what you don't know. And if you know it, you're not living like it. You're not that concerned about the church. There's other things that take your time. How in the world can you be a teacher of truth regularly in the class? So how quickly can it vanish away? Well, just as surely as bad people can be in the church, like Ananias and Sapphira, and God calls them to die and they were gone, there's already a turnover of good people dying and going too. And then who takes their place? Who teaches? Teaching what they know. Teaching what they know because they've studied it. Teaching what they know because they live it and have the experience and thereby the wisdom to be able to teach. Who's going to do it? So we may ask ourselves well what congregations are doing, but I still say it comes down to your home. And what God addressed in Ephesians 6 concerning the responsibility of fathers to see that the home is taught the truth, it begins there. The only thing the church can do regarding your children is supplement the teaching they ought to get every day at home and the example that you said. There are sermons like this. There are sermons twice a week, then we have classes. But there's not that many classes. That's all the Bible people get. That's all the understanding of Christianity people have. How can things continue? They just can't. So I want to ask some questions. It ought to begin with parents and teaching their children. That means they've got to be converted, completely converted, dedicated to Christ, and they're going to show their kids that's what life's all about. So let me ask some questions. And of course, this takes into consideration the growth and development that a child is physically able and mentally able to be able to know these things. Can your children give scriptural evidence for the one true church? And if they can't because they're too young, are you doing what's necessary to train them up in the way they should go from the standpoint of teaching them the truth? Can they, can they give the plan of salvation? Do they understand what hearing means? Is it, not, is it just something repeated at the end of a sermon? Do they know hearing the gospel means understanding it and what it means, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4? Making a personal application of it. Do they understand that faith comes in that way and what faith is? And then you go down the line of the plan of salvation, repenting, confessing. And do they even know what they're confessing? People say confessing. I don't know if they know what they mean. You're confessing that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is Son of God, or are you confessing sin? Just ask them. Do you go home with your children and say, did you understand what the preacher was saying today? If they're old enough, of course, to understand. Did you understand what was said in class? What's wrong with that? 
we seem to think that such things don't make much difference, but we wonder where, where are we going to go? What's going to happen tomorrow? What are we going to be? Well, if we don't start, it's just like having medical doctors and anything else. I think they've done a little studying. I think somebody tested and tried them when it comes to that or any other profession or vocation. Can your children express conviction that Jesus died for his church? And do they know the difference in the Lord's church as written on the pages of the New Testament and human churches' denominations? Do they know the difference? Can they tell you? Again, I'm taking into consideration, I keep repeating myself, that they're old enough to know the difference. I understand that. Would your children object to the use of mechanical instrumental music in the worship of, for any other reason than they know their parents object to using it? I have been persuaded for many years when I see kids grow up they are at their parents at every meeting of the church. They graduate from high school, given about four years of college or about that long whether they go to college or not outside the home, and what happens? You don't see them anymore. Why? Because they had no personal faith themselves. They had no personal conviction. They went because mom and daddy went, and mom and daddy assumed because they were with us all the way. They're right down the line. They're convicted of, of sin, and they're convicted by the truth. Well, they weren't. They just go on the mother and day's coattails. When they got out to where they could do what they wanted to do, they did. What would your children say to a church offering fellowship to all of the uh, pious, unimmersed, to those outside of Christ, but they're engaged in human religions? Are they all right? Do they fellowship them, be with them? I was doing some reading here not too long ago about uh, churches of Christ and how many of them over the past however many years it was have shut their doors. Well, we've had right here uh, churches shut their doors. And then the question goes, for those that were left there and they shut their doors, where do the people go? And what they have found out is that some people just quit going, period, anywhere. Others of them, because of what they've been hearing from the pulpit and taught, well, they just dropped down to any denomination because they've been told that they're all right, we're all right, everything's okay. So they don't see any use of, I mean, after all, they haven't done anything anyway. The door's always open, they get there, and they, and they come in, sit down, and they leave, somebody else locks it up, and that's Christianity. So what are they lost when they shut the doors? They just go somewhere else and, after all, they believe in God and Christ and the Bible, so it must be all right. Are we training our children to have a strong conviction and desire to save people's souls? And there's only one way they're saved, and that's by the gospel. And a whole host of people that think they're saved aren't, and they need the gospel. The denominational people are lost. They're not saved. Is there any compunction of conscience that says, I must teach them the truth? And to teach them, I must prepare myself. I'm not saying that everybody needs to become a preacher as I've spent my life. But I'm saying God expected every member of the church to do what they could to teach. Now, could you sit down with somebody with your Bible open, the privacy of your home or their home, and go through a series of studies that would be able, because of what you know yourself, that would convert them? Could you do it? Well, you always say, well, I can go get the preacher, I can go get an elder, I can go get... No, they're all dead and gone. They don't exist. What are you going to do? You're a Christian. Don't you know how you became a Christian? Don't you know what it means to be a Christian? Don't you know the Lord added you to the church? People nowadays, they, they, they'll go somewhere and the church is not there, or it used to be, and it's gone into denominationalism. And they go, well, what are we going to do? I don't think that ever crossed the mind of a person in the first century. They went there and there's no church. Let's start one. You don't have to go back 100 years before that's exactly what people were doing all around here. And that's how this church originally started through two elderly ladies who basically started it. That happened all over this land. But we have said, well, we've got to get somebody from over at Pius Holler to come over and speak to us because we don't know what to do. Well, there's always a, real, a reality of us needing help. Any of us need help. But are we trying to really prepare ourselves so individually I could teach somebody what to do to be saved? I've been a Christian 20 years. I just don't think I could teach the plan of salvation to anybody. 
Well, I question really how faithful you've been, if that's the case. Now, could your children give scriptural arguments for the Lord's Supper? The elements in it, what it is, what it represents, its design, its function, as well as its time of observance. Can anybody do that? I don't think there's a lot of folks who can do it, especially when you're being told that's no big deal, you're too picky and too narrow. Would your children feel any conviction as to whether a church should engage in fundraising pursuits other than free will giving? You just ask them. It's not hard. Can we go have a bake sale for the Spring Church of Christ and give the money to them? People aren't taught to say, well, we better go to the Bible and see what it says about that. Same thing through the Lord's Supper. Well, how to worship God when it comes to the music that pleases Him. Not a matter what pleases us. We're not in the pleasing ourselves business, except that they all want to please God. And I don't know any other way to please God, but do it His way <laughs> to you. Would your children feel any convictions as to whether the church should do works in the community openly, secular, in nature, as Christians or the church being a part of it? We say, well, we must do everything by the authority of the word. That's right. But every time something comes up we're not used to, do we know how to go to the New Testament and see, does the New Testament authorize this conduct and this activity? We're very much to the point where we're saying, well, I've explained to you that this is a plastic container. I've defined plastic uh, of water, and it is water. Right? At least originally that's what came in it, and I'm telling you that's what's in it now. Okay, I recognize that for what it is. But now let another bottle show up over here that's shaped different and has a color to it. And people may not even ask the question, is that authorized? Because it, it can be explained to us, this is a microphone. All right, I know that. But what if I come up against a microphone like this one over here? Is that a microphone? It looks different than this one. So I have to know the identifying marks of a microphone. Even as from the scriptures, by the authority of the word of God, I must know how to take everything that comes along and say, does the Lord, through his word, authorize this action? Or is it prohibited? If it's authorized, we can do it. If it's prohibited, we can't. If it's not authorized, we can't. And we apply that to everything. You know, to learn how to do this, just start off with the things that you're very familiar with. Do you, do you know? Can a person know? Come to objective knowledge. Can you do that? <laughs> I'll pick on J.D. J.D., is that woman sitting down right about middle of that pew, do you know she's your wife? That, that nod, I guess, equates with no. Now, we would have had a big problem if you'd said, how can I know? I don't know. And especially if I turn to her and say, is he your husband? I say, I don't know no more he does. <laughs> Do I have a choice after this late date? <laughs> now, you, you know, we laugh at that, and it is funny, but sometimes that's what hell really makes a point. But that kind of thing is being done all around us on matters pertaining to what must I do to be saved and what must I do to be faithful. What difference does it make? And so we go to the Bible. It's authoritative. It's God's infallible word. We ought to respect it. Well, what, do you, what do you mean by what you just said? How do you ascertain Bible authority? Because that's the authority of the Lord. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. Well, our children, they understand anything about that? They understand anything about how to study the Bible, what's involved in studying it, how they ascertain Bible authority? Would your children be able to state why the Church of Christ is not, is not a denomination? Could they explain the difference? Do your children believe that recreation and entertainment are a part of the work of the Lord's church? Well, now, all around us, that's going on, and even in the Lord's church. Have you ever thought to ask, well, the Lord certainly permits recreation and entertainment. Nobody would oppose that. It's obvious the Lord even recreated himself, and he would go aside and refresh himself. 
But is it the church's responsibility as a work of the church to do that? Can you answer that? Is there authority from the New Testament that it is? Well, that's going to carry you back then to a study of the three great institutions God set up. First the home, then civil government, and then the church. Now, what's the responsibility of mom and daddy? Hmm, now we're going to get into recreation. And it goes farther than that, teaching them how to work <laughs> and be responsible. So, it becomes not a work of the church to do such a thing as that, because I know God wants Christians to get together and have fun. In fact, we ought to enjoy getting together to do that. But recreation entertainment is not part of the work. That's part of the work of an individual at home. That's where that's to be done. And then the last one. There's a lot more you see we could get detailed on here. Would your children oppose a congregation of the Lord's church extending Christian fellowship to an independent Christian church or any other denomination? Would they? You might be surprised if you ask them because they may not even know what the question means because they don't know anything about fellowship. Who are we to fellowship as far as Christians? How do we determine who we can fellowship? I find that to be a big problem over the last many years. So these questions will tell us something about are we going to lose the tr truth shortly? Are we going to teach our children the truth so that they'll teach others? Then will we in the church teach, as the Bible says, the church is to teach in edifying its members? Well, although the list that we just noticed could be extended, the result causes us, I think, it does me, when I think of what Peter wrote, what we began with, and the passage from Psalms to, to spiritually tremble when we realize what will take place if we fail to properly teach our children and to teach one another concerning primitive, pure, New Testament Christianity. No wonder then the Lord over 2,000 years ago before his death in Luke chapter 18, verse 8, asked, nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? You know, the Bible's going to be here. It's a source of faith. There can't be any proper faith without proper knowledge of the Bible. That doesn't guarantee that people will be believing it simply because it's here. So we need to take a long, serious, heartfelt look at ourselves and our children and ask the question, will they and our children be faithful and true to Jesus Christ and his one church, the church of Christ. Will they? And I simply end with how I began. How long would it take to lose the truth? Pretty serious matter, and it's always one that will be so, has been since Old Testament times, since the truth of God was in this world. And God expected men to love it, believe it, and obey it. And it will be till the end of time. If you're not a child of God, we urge you to believe with all of your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Having done that, to repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30. Confess your faith in the Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10, 10. And to be buried with your Lord in baptism by the authority of Christ for the remission of your sins, Romans 6, 3, and 4. Colossians 2, 12. Acts 2, verse 38, Galatians 3, 26, 27, 1 Peter 3, verse 21, and others. There's a simple plan of salvation that when each step is taken, great changes take place in a man's mind and the core of his being, and that's called conversion. To where you will, when you come up in that watery grave of baptism, a new creature in Christ with new goals and purposes and desires to live your life, however long or short it may be thereafter according to the teaching of the New Testament. As a child of God, God now asks you, if it were this whole sermon, according to you, will we lose the truth in the next generation? If you have sinned, we urge you to repent. Come to the Lord, confess him, and we'll pray with you and for you, and God will forgive. And we urge you to do that now while we stand, while we sing.